thing about Jesus, that irregardless of where he was, what he did, or how he presented himself, he brought directly the presence of God, literally, into the circumstance and the situation so that there had to be a determination of something was going to give, something was going to happen. There was going to be a result because there was a confrontation between light and darkness, between truth and reality, between the very fact that the creator of the universe in the Son of God had come and presented himself as just humanity in the Son of Man to a circumstance and situation that would present itself as an observation to the entire universe to be able to look at it, to determine what it was that Jesus was saying what he was doing and what he represented as he presented himself as not only the Son of God, but as God's representative on earth to man. Because that in and of itself is shocking. It's a reality that we can't really grasp completely because only God himself could do it. How could God be in man? And how could man participate with him and not know that he is God? Because Jesus bluntly said things that were so radical and extreme that it separated itself from Judaism. It made it the fulfillment of what the prophets had said. It made it the completion of the law. It made it so real that you had to go back to the moment in time when God created the universe and said, I am the Lord thy God. And he walked with his creation in the beginning. And yet when he came to it, they recognized him not. So. Jesus, in coming to this place and time, when his, we examine it now and we call it the Sermon on the Mount, but he, he's coming to really talk about the kingdom. He's talking about the reality of God. He's talking about what he knows as a fact. He's stating a simple premise that he says, I say unto you. And there's a reason why he can. He was there at the beginning. He was with the lawgiver. He is the law. He has personified himself as being with the Father in all that had happened and occurred with creation and all that man had gone through in the results of his intervention and interaction with God Almighty. So the Jew was shocked in that here he was, the son of David, the son of man. Here he was, just a man, presenting himself with authority and talking to the people as one greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. And we read in the end of the Sermon on the Mount how he said that not only that the people were shocked, but he said, these things I say unto you, if you do them, I will liken unto you to a wise man. And he said, what would happen? The wise man, of course, would be blessed because no matter what happened, his house would stand. But he also said that, but... I say unto you, I will liken who does not do these things I'm telling you to do as to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And what happens then? Because you see, the people and the scribes and the Pharisees had taken the law. They had taken the prophets. They had taken these things and heard them, but they had interpreted them into fitting in a comfortable, in a certain way, that would make all oh, the scribes and the Pharisees righteous, but would it make the average man become holy unto God, or would he be wholly repelled by the very fact that righteousness could never be his? Because Jesus is confronting issues for every man. He has made himself a distinction that here on the Sermon on the Mount, there is a determination with which all things now have to look at, have to examine, and have to prove themselves by. Because this is the man who has said, I say unto you. So read at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Determine for yourself whether or not you need to know what Jesus said, because the reality is, you better. It's not something that's funny, it's not some theological idea that we put out there and we say, oh, well, the kingdom could be like this and someday it will, and oh, wow, how wonderful way it is. No. Or that we can say, oh, well, grace applies so we don't do it by his face, so we don't have to worry about what Jesus said, because after all, we have grace, and we don't need to worry about it. It's not in his place, so once we have it in his place, we can do what we want and go where we want and do as we will. No, because Jesus said right before the th these sayings of mine that if you do them, he said, but not everyone that comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, would enter into the kingdom of God, but the one that does the will of the Father. Whoa. He says, depart from me, I never knew you. Whoa. Do you know Jesus? The fact is, you need to know Jesus so that he can tell you what to do, so that you can walk according to his will and do the things he said. And that's why we have this devotional. What did Jesus say? 
I can't get into all the reasons why he's saying what he said, because we're talking about what he said. And that's what you are going to determine for yourself with the Holy Spirit in your world, in your day, as you look at what Jesus said. And so today, we've looked at the Beatitudes, and we've looked at how God blessed, and God made a bracha, and God how poured out his blessing upon the people in certain aspects of their relationship with him, and the poor in spirit, and all the other things that you already know, because you've seen some poster, and that you've heard, or you can read. But in the Sermon on the Mount, from chapter 5 through 7, the reality is confrontational. God is directly speaking to you. He is saying, you don't have a choice. This is what I say to you. And Jesus was always like that. The heart is the issue. The determination of what you do is your own. But you have to decide right now, what did Jesus say? Jesus says, as we've already looked at previously, but we're going to start in verse 22 because we've already read every single verse, line upon line, building upon each premise and knowing very well and factually that each and every line has a specific reason for being there and it is not determinate of some kind of preconceived idea and addition that we can interpret it and somehow make it a qualifier and make it as though without a context because in every line there is contextual reality of what the line itself says so what the line we're doing is looking at it exactly implicitly explicitly and directive to what you will know at least in your heart what jesus said because you can read it in context that's easy go straight through or just read it in verse by verse or read it in paragraph but for now, in verse 22, I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Three things Jesus said. Write them down, please. Recognize what the thing is and what the consequence is. Jesus is saying it. He said, look, you got to do what I said. You got to know what I said. In order to do what I said, you got to know what he said. So what did he say? What is he saying to you? But what did he say first of all? I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Notice it's without a cause. Now we're going to look at later on in Luke in a different way and in a different time and a different setting, the same thing but not the same way, because I don't believe that Jesus is saying the same thing reworded. I'm saying he's saying it differently because it is different. It's in Luke. Now you can take that or leave it as the way I explain it, but I don't care. We'll get there. But for now, what does this say in Matthew? What is it saying to you today? What are you hearing from me as the Holy Spirit works through us? He's saying that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. Do you have cause? Are you willing to present that before judgment? Because you see, it says without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Because if you have a cause, then judgment is going to be exercised over you for being angry. God is going to look at you of why you're angry and whether he needs to reconcile and you need to reconcile the situation or whether you need to be caused the full spectrum of the consequence of your anger towards your brother. But if you have a cause, then you can present that cause to God, and you can let God determine the consequences or the actions with which you should act. Because with the cause, then you can take it to the Lord. But without a cause, you're guilty. Because you have no reason to be angry, because if you turned it over to God, then you're trusting in Him. But you see, you have to be recognizing what Jesus is saying bluntly. He didn't say, don't not be angry. Although we may look at that in Luke later, but not today. But he is saying, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. The judgment every Jew knew. You don't want to be there. So then we look at whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Whoever is calling himself by a, a dirty word, we'll say, or calling himself some word that is derogatory. Let's just leave it at Raka. Whoever calls him Raka, here, Raka, shall be in danger of what? The council. What council? That's the law. The law could bring you up before using some person's name and defaming them in some way and slighting them in a defamation of character because you're calling them something that they aren't. So Jesus says, look, you can't do that. 
you can't slight the Samaritans. You can't slight the taxpayers. You can't slight the tax collectors. You can't slight those. But you are in danger of the council because the council will bring you up. So he's just telling you a practical reality that's a fact. He says, if you do this, you're in danger of the council. So it is a choice. You're in danger if you do it. So what would be your other choice? Don't do it. Recognize what he's saying. Recognize that he's telling you action, consequence. If you don't do it, you don't have the consequence. If you do the action, you've got a consequence. Are you willing to pay the price? Do you want to go before the council? Or would you rather go before God? Whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Oh my God. Did reality just come sinking in? Where and what is hellfire? And why would Jesus say, if you call someone a fool, that? You see, he doesn't say just cause or unjust cause. He says, if you just call someone an idiot, a fool, stupid, the reality is God is warning you bluntly. You do this, you're in danger. I don't care whether you're in salvation or you're in grace. Jesus said this. Jesus said at the end of it, if you do it, you're a wise man. If you don't do it, you're a foolish man. And he also said, if you say that, you know, well, I had these marvelous powers, works, and wonders, and I could do all these things in your name, and you're a worker of iniquity, in other words, doing these things that God told you not to do, like call someone a fool, and then you say that you know me, I'll say I never knew you, and guess what? Where did your salvation go? If Jesus doesn't know you, you have no salvation. The reality isn't just simply a confirmation by simply saying, oh, well, God, I accept you, and good God, you know, I'm running up to the altar, and so I'm automatically saved. No. Jesus says, if I don't know you, you are not saved. He says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. If Jesus doesn't know you, what is your salvation based upon? It's got to be on relationship with him and in him and through him and by him. Otherwise, if he doesn't know you, you don't have him. And if you don't have the son, you have no salvation. So the point Jesus is saying, don't call someone a fool. You're in danger. What are you in danger of? What is the consequence? You shall be in danger of hellfire. Whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger. Not might be, not could be, not will be, not is it possible, but shall be in danger. You better have a really good reason and you think you've got an excuse to call someone something, then you better know that God, in the form of Jesus Christ himself, who said, I am saying to you, you've heard it said this, I'm saying to you. He's saying to you now, are you really going to call someone a fool? You're in danger. And what are you in danger of? Hell, fire. And that is eternal damnation. So today, you have to decide in all three of these things whether you are going to be angry with your brother without a cause or not angry at all. Whether you are going to say to your brother, Raka. Or whether you are going to call your brother a fool. Would you prefer to be before the council? Would you prefer to be in danger of the judgment? Or would you prefer to be in danger of hellfire? Because the reality is, you want none of these things. So today, your determination is your choice. You can listen, and you can pretend that it's something else, or you can try to construe it and interpret it and make it into something it's not. But when you look at it, there's only one thing you can say. This is what Jesus said. Now, the determination for you is, at the end of what Jesus said, he said, if you do it, this is what happens. You're blessed. If you don't do it, this is what happens. Guess what? And if you think that because you know me, and you've done all these miracles and wonderful things, and yet you claim all these other things, and you haven't done what I said, pardon me, but when he says, Lord, Lord, and we've done all these things in your name, what then are we at when we say we are a Christian and we don't do the things that Jesus said? Are we Jesus-like? Are we Christ-like? Are we christian Christian, or are we just fooling ourselves? So today you have to ask yourself, what did Jesus say? And then you have to go out and do it.